The following is the recorded version of the presentation that was made by a great presenter during the Fall Idiot Quilter Retreat 2022. Um, some of you could not attend the retreat, but you did ask if I would record the presentations for viewing later, and here it is. So I hope you enjoy this. There are three different ones in this series, one by Adam from Adam Sews, one from Chris O'Neill from Sew the Distance, and one from Lynn Reinhardt of Cotton Art Studios. All three present presentations were excellent and very informative, so I hope you enjoy them. Okay, everybody, I'm very pleased that Adam has agreed to do a little presentation about him. He's, uh, I'm sure you have seen his YouTube channel, and if you haven't, then uh, you need to go to Adam Sows on YouTube. Adam does, you name it, Adam Sows, everything. Uh, there and your creations are all very beautiful. Um, I won't hold it against you that you love tulip pink with a passion, but that's okay <laughs> for everybody. So, Adam, welcome. And Adam is in the UK. And so, Adam, you're on. Tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, and yeah, it's all yours. Awesome. Thank you, Stephen. Um, so my name is Adam, obviously I am from uh, Hampshire in England, but just in the south of England. I am about 45, 50 miles south of London. Um, I moved down here a couple of years ago. Um, I, as Stephen said, have a bit of a problem with Tudor Pink, as you can see in <laughs> every single shelving unit in this room. Um, I mainly... I mainly sew bags at the moment, but I also make art dolls, which is what I was going to speak to you about today. There's some of them on the top of this shelf here behind me. There's one up above my shoulder. Um, these are patterns that are made by a lady in Australia. Um, but the there's only a few of them that are actually her patterns. Some of them are my own designs adapted from some of her patterns, and some of them are completely hand-drafted. Um, the the thing with the art dolls is they are subjective to however you want to make them really so you're given the basic patterns for them um and then there is like a master class online that you can take um to study about how to make them the reason why i started making them was because of the boston terrier which was the first pattern that was launched on the master class and owning two boston terriers i thought i have to make one so the first one I ever made was this one, um, and they all have, so they're fully articulated, they have, they have wooden bead joints in their elbows, they have normal teddy bear joints in their shoulders and hips, and then they have knee joints as well, so you can bend all their legs as well. Um, so this one was the first one I ever made, this has not got a sculpted nose, this has just got a normal standard nose. Um, the The clothing for them is completely subjective to which one I make. Um, none of them ever have the same outfits on. But the first one was, as I say, was Boston Terry that I ever made. I remade it about a year later because I wanted to focus more on the detail in the face. So the face on this one seems, to, to me, it's more realistic than the face on the first one. Um, and the ear positioning and different things as well changes the look of them quite a lot. Uh, the other ones that I have made are the goats, which are these ones here. Um, these have uh, sculpted horns and sculpted noses. So these are made from a epoxy clay. So the noses and the horns on them are actually like rock hard. So they actually feel like real goat horns. Um, just trying to look at my notes to see if there's anything I'm actually missing out here. So they are all, when I start to make one, I normally look at, I, I, I make some of them to commission, which is what I'm working on at the moment, which I'll show you in a second. I've actually got a half made head, which is quite creepy because when they start looking quite realistic, it does look a bit odd having one sat on your countertop without a body attached to it. So 
they are mainly all made from um, felt, which is the base fabric that they're made from. Um, the problem I have is choosing the right felt for the actual dolls, as a lot of them, a lot of felts seem to shrink. So they actually work better with the cheaper felts, which are poly, uh, polyester based. The viscose and the wool blend felts seem to shrink the minute you actually apply an interface into them. Um, and they also don't, for some reason, you can't shade them as well as the um, synthetic fibres. So all of the, the basic shading and everything that's done on them is using different types of pastels. So I either use artist pastels, oil pastels, or I use alcohol um, artist pens. And I've previously used um, some airbrushing as well, but I don't really get on with it as well. I don't feel like I've got as much control. So the, like with the goat here, this actually started, if I can find, it's, it's the felt that's on its arm here is unshaded. These, this face on this actually started the same colour as this felt here. Um, and then the inside of the ears was uh, like a baby pink. So all of the shading and everything on here to give it sort of depth and texture is all done with artist pastels and oil pastels. Um, the inside of the mouths on the goats have got epoxy clay on the inside as well. So they're actually sculpted sort of back to front, sort of inside out. So you actually end up by pulling the mouth in. So you actually get an indentation where the goat's underbite would be. Um, the goats are probably my favourite to make because they've got the horns which are sculpted on top of them as well. Um, I have also made... Uh, I will show you Pinocchio first. So Pinocchio was one of the most recent ones that were um, made. So he has fully articulated arms and wooden legs. So his joints all move and you can sort of see them because they're, they're supposed to be more exposed on Pinocchio so that they actually add to the sort of wood texture of him. So his knees are wooden as well. Um, they are filled with um, weighted material inside so they actually sit up upright on their own and the good thing about having the legs articulated is you can actually when they're sat down you can actually cross their legs over and they sit and sort of stand upright by themselves he's also his nose is actually fully articulated as well as his head so you can position his head and you can sort of turn his nose depending on which way up you want it for some reason um so these all, as I say, all of the clothes on them are completely removable. Um, his fedora was probably one of the most horrific things I've ever had to make because sewing so small circles like that is pretty, pretty fiddly. Um, so Pinocchio was the pattern that I used to adapt to make the pigs, which are the new sort of thing that I've started doing. Um, these have got completely, because these don't have mouths, their whole entire nose is sculpted from clay and then painted, so it has the shiny sort of pink skin effect. Um, and they also, these sort of actually adapted, so they've actually got a double eyelid like a pig has. Um, and the ears have got a, they have a product in them called Warbler, which is a thermo um, heated plastic. So you can actually, it bonds the two layers of the ear felt together. Um, the, the inner and outer ear and then you can actually heat it with an iron and mold the whole ear so then it doesn't so it forms a rigid ear with a sort of curled top to them um, and it retains the shape completely so this was an adaptation actually from Pinocchio's face and body so the head is the Pinocchio head and then it's got the whole freehand sculpted snout on there and the position of the eyes and the ears are completely different as well. Um, so I have made quite a few of these. These are the ones that I kind of have somehow managed to just obtain and they've just stayed here, um, but I'm not making any more for my own use, well, for my own sort of collection as they take up quite a lot of room and it's a little bit scary having so many of them staring at you when you're sewing. Um, I am working on a commission at the moment, which is a rat terrier, which is what I started yesterday, which is why it's got felt hanging off it where it needs needle felt on. Um, this is one that I've not made before. This is an adaptation which I've never done before. 
Um, and this has got a completely sculpted mouth, so all of its lips actually extend over the bottom lip, so it actually has upper lips to make it more realistic. Um, so this one is partially finished underneath the body. Um, besides those ones, the main thing is trying to work out how to when I'm putting them together, then one of the hardest things is trying to actually sculpt the shape of the face because as you felt the different felts onto them, it pulls, it can actually pull the shape of the head in as you felt it. So I've worked out a way of being able to actually go in with a sharp tool sort of through an area that you can't see. You can actually pull the, the shape of the head back out from the inside. Um, which is what I've been doing with the rat terrier that I'm doing at the moment because its face was getting narrower and narrower. Um, and the other, so I spoke about the warbler. Um, the other thing as well is always a difficult choice is choosing clothes and shoes. So some of the shoes are made, like the boots that this Boston terrier has got on. These are an actual handmade boot made from felt. Um, and then others, the, uh, Pinocchio has his own shoes, which actually come on and off with poppers. So they actually have a poppered sort of release on them. But I also source shoes online, which is why this one has Converse high tops. Um, so it's just a case of trying to work out what to put on them that suits that doll. I never really kind of, I've never dressed them or make their clothing until I know what they look like finally. Um, and it's surprising how you can make a whole outfit for them and it just doesn't look right to that doll. So some of them have had multiple changes in outfits during the making process. Um, and I think... That's really it in terms of the making process of them. The, yeah, I think that's it basically. Um, does anyone have any questions about them? That's, I suppose, something that I could ask. If you have questions right now that you'd like to ask uh, Adam, um, just unmute yourself and go ahead. Adam, my name's Amy. Do you use needle felting to attach and form the sculpting and the attach the felt pieces? I do, yeah. The the some of them are needle felted and some of them actually have different colored felts that actually go together to make the shape of the head in the first place. So the Boston Terriers, they have uh, the actual front of their face, like their their um their chin, their mouth, and the sort of strip through here is actually made from white felt. And this is made from black felt. Um, and then the rest of it is done through shading to remove the shape of those um, original pieces when they're made. But then there is other ones like the, the rat terrier that I'm working on at the moment. This was originally made from just white felt. Um, and all of the black that's on here is needle felted onto the top, like if he was needle felting from scratch. Um, an actual like needle felt from wool roving. And Amy had a question in the comments, and I guess it is have your has that been answered now for you, Amy? You asked, do you use needle felting to attach and form the pieces? I think Adam just answered that. Yes. Correct? Yes, okay. thank you. Um, a lot of people are saying that everything is absolutely stunning and it's amazing work. Um so any other questions for Adam? Adam you hey, it's Marie. Um how many hours and i know they're going to be different between the dogs and pinocchio that they're all fabulous but pinocchio is adorable about how many hours would you think goes into one of those uh pinocchio actually was one of the fastest ones to make um i think mainly because his shaving is sort of more natural because he's kind of skin colored in the first place and a lot of his features are a lot more prominent like his eyes and his mouth is actually stitched on rather than um sort of actually shading the he probably took me two days sort of probably about 16 to 20 hours in total to make 
Pinocchio, um, and then probably about another four or five hours to make his outfit. The dogs, the Boston Terriers, I think this, the second one that I made, which I personally think looks better than the first one, that one probably took me about four days solid. So they do take quite a while. Yeah, that's quite a bit of time. Thank you. There's quite a process as well with the, with the moulding of the epoxy clay. Um, because you have to mould a lot of it internally in the mouth to actually give the inside of the mouth structure. Once that's been put in, you have to leave it for 24 hours to cure as well. So I normally do the whole head, put the mouth, the clay inside the mouth, and then sculpt the nose onto the top because you, you cut a hole through the felt to actually expose some of the internal clay so that then you can bond the sculpted nose through the front through that hole to join the clay from the inside and the outside so they bond together so if you pull on the nose it will only pull on the clay that's inside the mouth so it won't ever fall off Ooh, uh, that's amazing and with that that takes a minimum of 24 hours to cure so i normally make the head sculpt the internal mouth and the nose and then leave the head to one side normally it, they they are normally sat inside a roll of parcel tape because it's the best thing to hold them up <laughs> Um, so they normally sit like that for 24 hours so that everything can firm up. Um, and that's mm -hmm. when they start working on the body. Hello, Adam. It's Mary Lou. Uh, do yeah. your animals have tails? <laughs> I was wondering how they sit down so nicely. Um, they don't. Um, I've never actually, I mean, I've, it's never something I've thought of because Boston Terriers generally don't have tails anyway. Um, I mean, I know my two that I've got lolloping around the house haven't got tails. Um, the I've never thought about whether I did, whether to put a tail on one of them. It kind of makes sense now, though, because most animals do have tails. The pig would look cute with a tail. Yes, <laughs> they're amazing. Thank you very much for showing us. Can you show us some of your bags? Uh, I can. Anything in particular? This Any one? and all. <laughs> Also, I want to see the marionette that's hanging on the wall. Oh, that, that okay, this is, this one here. Oh, attached to something else. This is a, this is actually from um, a shop in Italy, which is called Geppetto's Workshop. Um, and this was a present from my parents when they went to Italy. So. It's charming. It is absolutely stuck. I love this. I've got a model of Pinocchio as well that's made that's hand carved from wood. I, I, and I mean, people would think that I have like some weird obsession with Pinocchio or something. It's just randomly accumulated things with that are made with Pinocchio. I have a question for you, Adam. And you may have answered this, but I was doing some paperwork. Sorry, while you're talking. How did you get into this? How did you learn how to make these creations? Um, okay, so I started sewing garments when I was probably about 12. Um, it was something that, I don't know why, it was just something that I just sort of picked up. It was just something that interested me. And then when I was in sort of secondary school, high school, we, we had to do it as part of our course, our technology course. Would, you'd have to do woodwork, um, food technology, um, textiles and plastics, metals, different things. Um, and when I first sort of actually started getting some proper sort of education in how to sew, they, we only did it for sort of like sort of six week periods throughout the whole of the year. So they'd split us for the first six weeks from like September when you went back to school, you'd do food technology, then six weeks later you do textiles. So throughout the year, you would do a section of each type of um, technology class, I suppose. Um, and the after the first time of doing textiles, I then started going to like a, a one one day a week after school extra sort of learning sort of class that they would hold. I think it was on a, a Wednesday afternoon or something. They'd for like three hours from school finish to sort of six in the evening. You could then go to the the textile department and work on whatever you wanted to work on, basically. And then when I started doing that, I, I was making like 
um, pajamas and soft toys, dressing gowns, all sorts of different weird things. But but I then I then when we were then sort of like halfway through secondary school, we were allowed to then choose what technology we wanted to do from then onwards until we finished school as part of our sort of like curriculum we could pick one in particular and I obviously chose textiles um and for our final sort of like our final test I suppose for that subject in the last year of school we were given the option to make things for we were kind of given like a criteria of of different categories that we could pick to actually make for that final assessment and most people picked um children's play mats which were essentially a quilt um and i chose an item of clothing aimed at a child which was a very very sort of like sparse take on what i actually did i i ended up making a bridesmaid's dress for a child um which was an adult size six and my teacher kind of like wangled it and allowed me to get away with it under that sort of criteria so i made a fully boned fully lined full net everything prize mode dress when everyone else was making um children's play mats wow that's kind of interesting how you've done gone from all of these different things into well like i said at the beginning of this you sew everything you really do well, if it can go through a machine, I'll, I'll have a go at it, basically. <laughs> so speaking of machine, what is your current machine that you do most of your creations on? Um, I, it's kind of a 50-50 split. If it's straight line, anything like sort of straight line quilting, piecing, um, or anything that involves a huge amount of layers, like if I'm making slippers, um, which is something that I'm currently a bit kind of into making, I use like three layers of batting, a layer of foam, a layer of denim for the sole, and then a layer of quilting cotton on top. So that I won't put anywhere near my vanina because I'm terrified of breaking it. That just goes through the um, Janome 1600P because that will just sew through pretty much. Well, I know that it will sew through anything because it sews through butterfly headed quilted pins. Mm. <laughs> and we want to know how you know that? Yeah, I think we know. <laughs> It will go straight through the heads of them, and then you have to then get pliers and actually snap the heads out of the stitching. <laughs> so I know that you have a little store. So if people, can you tell us a little bit about that? Like what will they find there? Where did they go if they want to buy some of your creations? Yes, yeah, so my website is adamsoes.com. Um, I have a on well, it's it's basically essentially just an online store. It's it's instead of an Etsy store because Etsy fees are just bonkers. Um, the stuff that I kind of, I'm really particular what I put in my store because I make a lot of things throughout the week, but if it's not, I'm my own worst critic at the end of the day. If, if something isn't essentially as good as I think it can be, it doesn't go in the store. So there's, there's I have a lot of things like bags, makeup bags, I sell slippers, I've got some of my art dolls on there. Um, I've, I, my top seller at the moment seems to be caddies mm, um, nice. and they I've got quite a few of the oh and pin cushions as well everyone seems to love these armchair pin cushions well, that's um, cool. so yeah it basically it's just anything I mean these caddies I've got three of them which I use underneath my desk which has just got stuff they're just random stuff but they it kind of because I do so many different types of sewing and quilts and different things I kind of got a caddy for each one that I can just sort of pull out and it's got everything related to that sort of part of sewing in that caddy so Evelyn Martin has a question she said asked do you uh do you uh okay do you a needle felting machine do you need a needle felting machine or do you do that hand felting uh, I do it by hand, by um, normally with a single needle, which is um, probably not the most sensible way of doing it because they tend to snap quite frequently. I lost two yesterday, and I can't tell you where the ends of them have gone. <laughs> Be careful walking around in your bare feet. Um, and uh, also another question here. Uh, 
Laura wants to know, do you work outside the home or is this your full-time career? Uh, I actually have three jobs. I have a full-time job Monday, to, uh, Tuesday to Saturday. Um, and then I have, I'm also a hairdresser privately. Um, so I have clients that I see, which is still based in London. Um, and then I have my sort of like side hustle on with my store um, okay. as well. So I've kind of so you're, I don't know how you find time to sew, <laughs> really. You're really busy uh, and you're here too. So, I mean, God, that's incredible. There must be two of you. Um, another question is from Amy Chapman. She wants to know, is that caddy a buy Annie or your own design? And also, do you have patterns for sale? So the caddy that is up on the wall over there, that is a, um, that is a buy Annie. That's an in control pattern. Um, the ones that are under my desk, these ones, which are bigger, uh, these are my own pattern, which I will actually be launching as a PDF soon. Um, so the bigger one, that one is one of my, um, patterns. This is another one, which is essentially the same thing. Um, that's one of my patterns. I am in the process of testing a pdf at the moment which is what i was actually doing earlier before this i was running up another um test pattern which is for a set of nesting pouches which will be that is the largest uh, that is the medium and then there's a smaller version as well um which i'm currently with pattern testers at the moment um and they will also have a separate part of the pattern which will tell you how to put the vinyl uh, the vinyl window in the center as well so you can essentially see what's in your pouch without having to unzip the ball um so the, that was what I, this morning i was making a final version of the large size um, and that is due to be launched hopefully by the end of november and uh uh well is there any more questions i don't see any more in the comment section but does anybody else have a question for adam that you'd like to ask right now make sure you unmute yourself so he can hear it Adam, this is Jean. How do Hi, you? Jean. How are you? How, how do you uh, source your um, zippers and all you know, and, and all the things that go along with everything you do? do um, you so I I have got wholesale accounts with some suppliers, um, which is this big thing here, which looks like a um, totem pole, is actually a, is actually a full bolt of um, bag making foam. Um, I have three three bolts of that at the moment in here, which is taking over quite a lot of room. And um, my zips, I've actually found the cheapest place to get them is on AliExpress. Um, and I have, this is my <laughs> extensive supply. Of oh, <laughs> okay. um, so I, yeah, I tend to buy it. I have those and I have another Biani pattern, which is another one full of zips. Um, so I have wow. To, but when you make as many things out of zips as I do, it's you go through it really quickly. But the cheapest place that I found, which is even cheaper than wholesale, is AliExpress because it comes direct from China and it's exactly the same quality. What's it called? Ali? AliExpress. It's a bit like um, Wish. Oh, okay. But it's more predictable. <laughs> Any other questions for Adam? Hello, Adam. It's Caroline here. Hello. Um, looking at your T-shirt, I was just wondering if if you'd ever made a gremlin. Uh, do you know, uh, it's a good. That is a good thing. I I would like to at some point. The only thing is, is that this. If I made one, it would it would have to be for my own sort of collection because of oh. doors and different things. Um, because the Pinocchio is. It's like a Pinocchio inspired doll. So they've, there's a way around it that they've done with that pattern. Um, but I think anything like like this, this is actually something that I made this t-shirt. Oh, it's it's, it's, it's a bloody door. Um, but yeah, it would be a good one to make because you could mold all the ears out of the warbler as well. So it's, it's something to definitely think about. Anything else anybody wants to ask? I think you're going to get a lot of business when you put some of this stuff up on your store because I'm seeing some comments in here where people are saying they 
love the bags and things like that. So I have a feeling you're going to be doing some business. <laughs> I know Eddie that was in earlier. He's got one of my art dolls. Yes, I remember Eddie telling me that he had purchased one of yours. Um, now, Laura says, can Adam show a makeup bag? I can. Um, this is, well, I, I do two, well, three different types of, well, I say three, but I do more than three. So I normally, there's the standard sort of like makeup bag to go in your handbag um, or purse, as you would call it in the States. Um, these are the sort of clam shaped ones. I also do the sort of like carry on sort of makeup caddies. Um, which are pretty cool. They have got quite a sturdy sort of build to them. And then I do the ones that are these ones, which are one of the worst patterns in the world to make, which flip open and they have like multiple zips inside. This one is made from, I think, 14 different Tula fabrics in total because every single fabric every single pocket is a different fabric and then every single line into each pocket is a different fabric as well oh wow but um these amaze me because you can literally they're like mary poppins bag you can put so much in them so yeah those are some of the makeup bags so any other questions No. So, uh, Adam, is there anything else you'd like to uh, tell us about? Um, I'm not sure. I don't think so. Uh, what about your wall hangings? Um, this one is, this isn't actually a wall hanging. This is just a quilt block that's attached to oh. another wall hanging. Um, this is, I was talking to um, Marie about this when we done our little sew and chat video. Um, this was a... This is actually four different patches, which I then, instead of putting just a quarter circle into the sort of drunkard's path type block that it's supposed to be, I ended up thinking it was a really clever idea to put four together and put a circle in the centre, which I don't advise doing. <laughs> um, and my idea with that was, was to make sort of like, I was gonna make um, 20 of them and do like a four by five quilt which would then almost be sort of like a double bed size, basically. But I made the one block and then thought differently about that. Mm. But this one here is just a sort of like, it's just a, this was just to sort of showcase the fabrics because I didn't really know what to do with the faces when I bought them, first of all, and I just wanted to be able to see them. So I just stuck four together with some sort of like um, borders and just, played around with some free motion quilting on them well they look great with that so just before we um finish up on adam's presentation any other questions seeing none uh if you do have questions for adam uh, i don't know how long adam's going to be hanging around uh with us um but more than welcome to stay as long as you can but i know it's five hours into the future at uh, your end of the world there as well but thank you so much for this presentation it was excellent it was great you're so talented i wish i could sew like you but i just and i still don't understand how you do all of this and work too that's incredible so thank you adam so much for this and if anybody has more questions for adam um you can put them in the comment section actually i'm just looking here um i think barb has a question do you make other pin cushions she would like to know um i don't i might uh, the only other ones i make are the wrist pin cushions which are the ones that are from marie's tutorial marie's channel which is marie scrappy creations um this is one of those things that you never need knew you needed until you make one and I've made these for a few of my sewing friends as well. And one of them keeps going to bed with it on because she forgets that she's wearing it. And the only time she remembers that she's got it on is when she tries to put her arm underneath her pillow. Um, but there is the, the lady that makes the pattern for the armchair pincushions is um, Lisa Pay, and she is Pay It Forward on YouTube. 
and all of her pincushion patterns are free and available for free download through the link underneath each of the videos that tell you how to make them. So if anyone wants to make any of those, all of the patterns are readily available on her, her YouTube channel. And what was her uh, YouTube channel again, Adam? It's called Pay It Forward. Pay It Forward. Oh, yes, I know who she is. Yeah. Okay. So Pay It yep. Forward, people, if uh, you want that. One of her other patterns, which is kind of pointless, but it's kind of cute, which is the... Um, <laughs> it looks... Yeah, it's fun, though, isn't it? Um, so... I'm going to finish up your presentation right now, but I'm just, everybody is saying that they love your work. They think it's amazing. They think you're very talented and your creations are beautiful. So, and they are. So thank you, Adam. I'm so happy that you were able to do this presentation for us uh, today. I'm sure people will be checking out your channel, your store and everything else and looking forward to when you actually put, have some of your patterns available as well. So thank you so much for that, uh, Adam. And I'm just going to turn on the recording right now.